George, I know you've been focusing on dark matter. And what to me is remarkable about dark matter is the vast dispersion of orders of magnitude differences of what dark matter is. That there is dark matter is not controversial. I mean, the data has been there for many, many decades in, in the 20th century in terms of uh, the speed of, of stars uh, rotating around the center of galaxies. You need dark matter. So nobody disagrees with that. But what dark matter is, th there's this dramatic disagreement. And the orders of magnitude go from the low end of what, 10 to the minus 22 electron volts to uh, WIMPs, uh, weakly uh, uh, interacting massive particles that are uh, uh, a, a billion or a trillion, 10 to the ninth, 10 to the 12th electron volts. So that's an order of magnitude of, of, uh, of uh, 34 times. And then you, you have potential of primordial black holes. So it, it's mind boggling and it's shocking that there is uh, so much agreement that there is dark matter, but such vast disagreement of what it may be. What do you think? The, the, the thing is, we know stuff of, some stuff about the dark matter. That is, anybody who is uh, fact-based or whatever it is, <laughs> I was going to say, sensible people in, <laughs> in physics and astrophysics really believe there is dark matter, even though a lot of people don't like it, right? They didn't like having to add, add these new ingredients. I mean, dark matter and dark energy, and only 5% of what we know is stuff we know. And it's not, that's, that's not a good advertisement. But the fact is, almost everybody understands there's dark matter. And almost everybody understands it has to be predominantly what we call cold dark matter, or at least very cool dark matter. That means that at the time when the matter and the radiation separated, the, that matter was cool enough that it could clump up by itself under its gravitational stuff. And that means it's non relativistic right, compared to where it is. Now, neutrinos could be non relativistic except all the neutrinos we know have a very low mass, so they stay fairly relativistic. So if there's another neutrino we don't know about, whatever it is. So the, part of the dark matter is neutrinos, but it's a very tiny part, and it's not so cold. Whatever it is, is cold. Now, what can be cold? Well, we thought WIMPs could be cold. There are these heavy massive particles that only interact weakly, and by gravity, they can, they can naturally be cold. And primordial black holes can be cold, because so they'll just act like giant WIMPs, right? But how can something whose who's constant wavelength is you know, light years, how can that possibly be cold? Well, the answer is, if it's a boson, that is, if it's a kind of particle that, that Bose and Einstein carried, as opposed to Fermi and Dirac, it has an integral spin. In this case, we're thinking something can spin zero, which nobody knew of before 10 years ago that, that, that any existed. Um, then it can condense into a single quantum state. So you can imagine you have this thing that's huge in wavelength, tiny, tiny in mass. That's because the, the Planck's constant divided by the, by the mass basically is giving you an idea of the wavelength. Um, the, the, um, if you do that and you imagine you put a really large number of these together, so you have a Bose-Einstein condensate. So you know, we have colleagues in condensed matter atomic physics that make atom Bose-Einstein condensates or something like that. And they have you know, a large number, like a, a million, it's a really big thing. But here we're talking <laughs> astronomical numbers, <laughs> right? So that you're gonna have a mass which could be the equal to the central bulge of our galaxy, right? Wow. And this, and then you have this thing that acts like a classical, well, classical quantum mechanics. So I don't know exactly, but, you know, a non-relativistic quantum mechanic kind of a situation, where you have a central soliton, which is a single Bose-Einstein condensate, and then slightly excited states of that same material that are orbiting around it, and that looks just like cold dark matter, as long as you were to get away from the central soliton. So in practice on the big scale, as soon as you get outside the scale of the center of a galaxy, it looks like that, except for the fact that it's wavy. It's, you know, it's got all these deroyed wavelength fluctuations all over the place, whereas the WIMPs would just be kind of a smooth soup and, and that kind of thing. And so they're not so different 
but they're really, I mean, this is like quantum mechanics in real life on a scale that's galactic. That's great, you know, that, that gets me excited. You know, I used to not like black holes very much until I started teaching a course about it. The students loved it. Now I would love it <laughs> to get to teach them about large is there, any, is there any possible experimental evidence that could distinguish uh, between the, the two, between WIMPs and, and uh, what you have as the super ultralight uh, um, bosons, the uh, Einstein uh, condensate? So th the answer is yes, there are several things that can distinguish them. Um, I, have a, I have a simple one with some of my colleagues where if you had in our galaxy and you had pulsars in our galaxy, you could look for you know, the, the frequency changing as the, because this is a quantum state, it's oscillating at its Compton wavelength, it's, it's uh, in a Compton frequency, it's oscillating, its potential will change, it will change its frequency, it'll change its phase, you could do that. But you need to have the pulsar in the right place and another pulsar to compare it to, so you can see. But we've been trying to look at data on dwarf galaxies. Dwarf galaxies should have a core that's made of these, these, this condensate, but as you try and make it smaller, you can't. That is, you try and make a lower mass galaxy, it actually has to expand because the, because the de Broglie wavelength gets larger. And so by looking at these dwarf galaxies, you can, uh, you can try and look and see that. And we've also looked at this stuff, and we also want to do the gravitational lensing and look along a caustic and see if we can see the waviness of the caustic that comes from the wave nature. And so that's one of the ways you can distinguish it. We want to do a series of experiments that can distinguish between the primordial black holes, the WIMPs, and then so we know which way to be pursuing it. And it's kind of fun to work with the wave dark matter. It's, <laughs> it's no different, right? <laughs> well, George, this looks uh, to the future in terms of the kinds of experiments that will continue to um, uh, to make precision cosmology even more precise and answer not just uh, 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 questions of decimal points, but now distinguishing between two radically different mechanisms of what dark matter is. So as precision cosmology develops, uh, what, I, what I'd love you to do is kind of look to the future. We've, we've enjoyed looking to the past, but look to the future, uh, the next decade, the next several decades. Uh, what are the kinds of progress that uh, are being planned and that you hope to see? Okay, so you get progress in science, A, when you free your mind and think about new things. <laughs> you could do that anytime, but somehow, usually some new thing has to come up. Then B, when you get new ways to observe things, new technology, new detectors. And so we have a whole bunch of those. We expect within the year from now, the James Webb Space Telescope will be launched, and that will allow us to do probing out to a higher redshift. And with a bigger angular resolution so we can do it in the infrared and that's but that'll let us probe back to the earlier times in the universe. We expect that there will be a next generation of cosmic microwave background experiments that try and measure things on the really smallest angular scale much more precisely. That requires bigger dishes that look smaller. And we expect that that LIGO and Virgo are joined by CAGRA, and then eventually, in, within the decade, by LIGO India. The waves, yeah. Right, and so gravitational waves will be providing us more information. And then LISA, the, 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 the in space. So there are going to be mm -hmm. new devices and new data, new observations coming in, and that should jar us and be thinking about new stuff. And what we can hope is some brilliant person will come up with some theoretical ideas that will kick us over. Now the problem is there's a thousand theoretical papers a year and none of them are right so far, but, or at least so we can tell. The problem is, you know, you don't give them credit. You give them credit if it's a good idea and if it might lead to something later, right? Because there are not too many times you make a big breakthrough. But the fact is we depend on the theorist to think about new ways that we can look at the data so that we can test things and, and see what we're trying to, trying to find out. What's your best guess of uh, what, where we'll be if, if we have a, another meeting like this uh, you know, 20 years from today and you and I look exactly the same and we're, we're you know, very, very buoyant and looking back on the 20 years in the future from now until then, 
what, 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 what do you think you'll be able to say? Right. So right now I'm not foolish enough to try, you know, having the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic come up and just throw all my travel plans and all my projections <laughs> completely in disarray in, within a month. I mean, it just, I kept, and for a while, two or three months, I was thinking, well, it'll get back to normal. Now I'm thinking, oh, it'll be good if it gets back to normal by next fall and <laughs> we'll see what happens. But it gives you a different perspective. However, I have to think we're going to be making progress and it's going to be still exciting to be in cosmology. So I have a story I can tell. So I don't know if you know who, who Shandu Sekar is. He made, he's a, he was a famous Indian physicist, but he was at the University of Chicago. He made a, he would work in a field and make a bunch of advances and move on. Cause he said every 10 years, you should move on so that the young, you've, you've sort of cleaned up what you know and the young people have a chance to go on and you can move some new area and, and do that. But he did that until he got to cosmology and he stayed in cosmology for a while and then died. But, and I'm saying, I think cosmology is gonna last a while longer because it's really broadly defined subject. And so, you know, normally a, a field would get kind of filled up, but the universe is a big place and there's a lot of stuff to do and look at. And so it's really hard to predict which way we're going, what's going, to, what's going to go on? But I think, you know, we could be we could be lucky, and we could get to the point where we're saying oh, we did pretty much everything. I think we got to go look at a different field. <laughs> That'd be great. That means I lived through the peak time, but <laughs> and we know the answers now. But because there's still a lot of stuff I want to know the answer to. Twenty years from today, you have a date. We're going to get back, and and we'll we'll look back on those twenty years and 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 see what happened. It's it's really been a remarkable ride, and I look forward to the future.